right into the study today. Father, we do want to thank you so much for your many blessings to us and for the privilege you've given us to come together on your holy day to worship and to study, to fellowship with one another. And Lord, I just pray now that as we open your word together, we begin our studies in the United States in Bible prophecy that, Father, you would give us clear and understanding minds and receptive hearts. For we pray this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to remind you, we do have a full day today. We've got um, the United States in Bible prophecy, and then when this one's over, uh, we'll go into the other room, into the sanctuary, and we'll be taking a look at pagan principles and Catholic concepts. Then at 3.30, we'll be viewing the movie um, William... Uh, John Wycliffe, yeah, Tyndall's next week, okay. Uh, John Wycliffe, and then at 5 o'clock, we will be taking a look at how Satan has corrupted the gift of tongues. So we've got a full day today, and we'll be having sort of a Bible extravaganza, if you will. Amen. So as we look at this subject today of the United States in Bible prophecy, we're going to see that we're going to be looking at an attack upon the freedoms that we have here in this country. Uh, we are a, a country that is built upon religious freedom. We'll be looking at some of that as we go through the prophecy today. Um, what happened was people from Europe and other parts of the world began to flee the persecution uh, because of their religious faiths. And uh, we've studied this before when we looked at that 1260 years of persecution and how people like the Walden Seas, the Albigen Seas, the Huguenots, others like that were killed because they would not submit to the dictates of the established church. And so as many as 150 million people died during those persecutions of what we call the Dark Ages. But um, people began to flee to a new continent over here, and they came over on uh, uh, various types of ships. The first settlement was actually established in Jamestown in 1620, but as these people came from different parts of the world, particularly from England and Europe in those days, they were seeking a place where they could worship God without fear of repercussions. So deep within every human heart today still, there is a, a pilgrimage for freedom. Uh, this is why so many people during um, the Soviet uh, period of the, uh, of the communist regime, people gave their lives trying just to get into freedom, to cross over from East Germany into West Germany. It happens in Korea, it happens in China, it happens anywhere where people's freedoms are taken, they're willing to risk their lives, even lay them down, uh, in order to get to a place where it is free. Now, as I mentioned about the establishment of Jamestown, we see here the first permanent English settlement was made in Jamestown, Virginia, in 1607. The Mayflower reached our shores in 1620, and by 1701, the population of the American colonies totaled a whopping 262,000 people. We have more than that in Fort Worth, you see. Then we see that by 1749, it had reached 1,045,000. And by 1775, when we were about to enter into the Revolutionary War, we had 2,802,000 people in this country. Um, that have come to settle in this country. Now, this is not including the Native Americans that were here. So in 1620, then we have the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Our Bill of Rights was signed in 1789. It was adopted in 1791. And now I want us to share a few quotations today as we're going through some of this. And... Um, 
John Quincy said, in defense of our civil and religious rights, with the God of armies on our side, we fear not the hour of trial. Though the host of our enemies should cover the field like locusts, yet the sword of the Lord and Gideon shall prevail. You know, we have a lot of discussions and laws being enacted now, declaring separation of church and state. These people know not what they speak of because separation of church and state, according to the founding fathers, was that the government would make no laws regulating church. And so here we see, we're going to see all of our founding fathers. God was the focus of what they were presenting as we were seeking our freedom here. Again, we shall not fight alone, said a man that you all know well when you hear his last words here. God presides over the destinies of nations and will raise up friends to us. The battle is not to the strong alone, it is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. And now the words all of you know. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. This was the mindset of the founders of this country. This was how our nation was established. Um, Benjamin Franklin, one of our great statesmen from back then, says, we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible to the danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine uh, protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. Do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs the affairs of men. These were the politicians, if you will, of the past. Doesn't sound anything like the ones that we have today. George Washington, watch this one. It would be particularly improper to omit in the first official act my fervent supplications to the almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. We ought to be no less persuaded that the proposition, the, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation, watch this, that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. That's our first president. Don't compare him to the one we have now. You see, what we see is a tremendous change that has already begun to take place. From the uh, book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, we find a tremendous account of how this country developed. It says the struggle of the American colonies for independence began in 1775. In 1776, they declared themselves a free and independent, a uh, free and independent nation. In 1777, the delegates from the 13 original states, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, in Congress assembled, adopted the Articles of Confederation. In 1783, the War of the Revolution closed with a treaty of peace with Great Britain whereby the independence of the United States was acknowledged by territory ceded to the extent, watch this, of 815,615 
square miles. I think the state of Texas is bigger than that. Let's see. In 1778, the Constitution was framed, and by July 26, 1788, it went into effect. The United States thus began with less than one million square miles of territory and less than four million citizens. Look at what has become today. From that little beginning to one of the most um, awesome nations in the world. And if you've never traveled to another one, uh, do that. And then you'll come back and realize how awesome the U.S. really is. You will understand why people from all around the world want to come here. Because of what this country stands for. You know, our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, said, if we could first tell where we are and whether we are tending, we could tell better what to do and how to do it. You see, know where you are and know where you're headed, and then you'll know what to do to get there, you see. And this is what our founding fathers, the, the, the people who lived before us, that helped bring this country to what it is, this was the approach that they took. In the book of Second Peter, it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. You see, we have prophecy that can do for us what Lincoln was talking about. If we look at that and we see from Scripture where we came from, where we are and where we're headed, we know more about how to get to where we're headed. And prophecy lays these things out for us. So what does prophecy in the Scripture reveal to us? both now and what lies ahead for us in the future. I want to go back to another one of our great founding fathers, James Madison. He says, because 15 centuries of ecclesiastical establishments have given birth to superstition, bigotry, and persecution, and this bill could do the same, who does not see that if the same authority which can establish Christianity in exclusion of all other religions may establish the same ease any particular sect of Christians and exclusion to other sects. You see what they saw? If, if the government makes a law favoring any one particular church or religion or denomination, well then what would present, prevent them from making laws to go the other direction? This is why the men understood that the government needed to stay out of the realm of religion because it would swing whichever way the politician happened to want to go depending upon where uh, by the way it was very possible that today we might all be Muslims if the politicians could have their ways so we, we have to understand that something was going on we had a constitution that was established to help protect the liberties of this country. And in that Constitution, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now that's the First Amendment. Now where does it say in that amendment that the government can tell you that you can't have a meeting someplace? It says just the opposite, that they cannot make any establishment to prohibit the free exercise of your religion. But it has happened. In the beginning days in this country, most religious meetings, or at least many of them, were held in either the town halls of the communities or in the schools of the community. Those were the two big meeting places. Today, try to get a meeting, a religious meeting in a city building. Try to get one in a school. I used to have meetings in schools all the time. Uh, but now, you know, in the last several years, I've not been able to get any school willing to let us even go into the gymnasium. Because it's a violation of the Constitution. Where is it a violation of the con? We got the law speaking for us now. <laughs> in the early days, Meetings were actually held in the Senate and House chambers. Oh, in Washington, yes, exactly. 
And that's why we have all of the inscriptions on all those public buildings that, that say the things that they do. That's why on our money it says in God we trust. And, and today, you know, they want to go and deface all of the public buildings just to get God's name off of there. So that's what we have come to today. Our Constitution says that Congress can make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting free exercise of the same thing across the board. Notice again, Article 6. No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. These are things that are built right into our Constitution. The Statue of Liberty has this inscription. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. You see, these are the concepts upon which this country has been founded. And we see throughout Scripture that God respects human freedom. He gave all of humanity a free will, the freedom to choose. And that's why from the very beginning he's made such appeals as choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. We have minds capable of choosing and if those minds are working right, we can make intelligent choices. So, again, part of our Constitution, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Declaration of Independence. You see, these are, again, these principles. But as we come down to today, these final issues are going to in, uh, impact our freedom of conscience and how we worship God. We've studied some of these already under the beast of Revelation 13 and also um, some other studies that we've had on the Antichrist. So with this, how does all of this fit around the United States. What role will the United States of America play in all of this? If the U.S. is such a superpower, do we think that God would not include it in the prophecy? If the U.S. is to play such a vital role in both giving freedom to people and what the role it will play in the last days, you can bet that it's in the Word of God. So in Revelation 13, we're going to go back there for a little bit today, and we're going to see that we studied one of two beasts. There were two beasts in Revelation. The one that came up out of the sea that was like a leopard, had the feet of, you know, had this composite beast of a lion, bear, leopard, and dragon-like beast, had crowns on its heads and stars in its crowns. But we're going to see that there's another beast that's going to come up. That first beast we studied and we saw that that beast was none other than the Roman Catholic Church. It is the papacy. And there's no question about that at all. But take your Bibles now and let's go to Revelation 13 and look at this other beast. Revelation, the 13th chapter, and beginning with verse 11. John says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. That's the beast from the sea. That's a Catholic church. And causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast. Remember, the image of the beast was what? 
No. I got to preach that one again. What was it? Okay, the image of the beast is apostate Protestantism. The, basically the daughters of the great harlot. So it is that form of religion that is simply a reflection of the first one, or Catholicism. Remember, when Protestantism started, it was a derogatory term, Protestant. I'll be talking about that in the next meeting, that people were persecuted because the Protestants were trying to bring people back to the Word of God. Now we're going to see that Protestantism, and we saw this when we studied in Revelation on the churches, goes back to the Mother Church. And um, I saw a video that I'll refer to in the next, uh, next meeting of how the Pope and, and Kenneth Copeland and the evangelicals are all coming back together again, separated brethren, coming back to Joseph, who is Pope Francis, to weep upon his shoulder and be received back into the family. This is a horrible thing that's a lying ahead for us. And so we see that this image of the beast, this apostate Protestant um, entity now, um, it says here in verse 14 again, that he deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, to Catholicism, which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. Killed. And he causes all, both small and great and rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Who's doing this? The first beast or the second one? It's the second one. It's the second beast. It's not Catholicism. It's this beast that comes up out of the earth here who, are, who is doing these things. And so... In Revelation 13, 11, he says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. But when he spoke, he spoke like what? The dragon. the dragon. You see the change in character from a lamb to a dragon. I mean, you can't get much wider apart than those two things. And so who is this second beast that comes up out of the earth? Again, watch this. It, it gives you a very good understanding of this from Uriah Smith. The power symbolized by the two-horned beast must be some nation distinct from the powers of the old world. So it's different from what's over in Europe, whether civil or ecclesiastical. It must arise in the Western Hemisphere. It must be seen assuming a position of prominence and influence about the year 1798. It must rise in a peaceful and quiet manner, not augmenting its power and expanding its territory as other nations have done by aggressive wars and successful conquest. By the way, how do we get Manhattan? Beads. Beads. I'd sure like to buy it back. <laughs> you see, it, we came over and we, we treated these people who lived here uh, like a bunch of idiots. We bought everything from them for trinkets. Watch where it goes. But not by wars until we got out west and then that began to happen. Uh, its progress must be so evident as to stri strike, that should be strike, the beholder with as much wonder as would the per perceptible growth of an animal before his eyes. It must exhibit before the world as an index of its character and the elements of its government two great principles which are themselves perfectly just, innocent, and lamb-like. And it must perform its work after 1798. Friends, this can only refer to one power. And the power would be the United States of America. The two-horned beast, you know, it's a big beast, but it's got horns like a lamb. Have you ever been up close to a buffalo? 
<laughs> I got out of my car one night up in the Dakotas and I'm walking to a rest area and as I'm almost halfway there, I hear some rustling in the brush to the side of me and out comes this great big bull buffalo. Just walked right, I, I could actually have reached out and slapped him. He was that close to me. You see, these things are massive. I came down out of the hills in, in Teddy Roosevelt National Park once with my brother-in-law and I'm driving along and I said, look at that dummy down there with no headlights on. It was at night. And I just saw this car I thought, I got down there, it wasn't a car. Buffaloes don't have headlights. <laughs> and he was walking around in the middle of the road, bigger than my car. But their horns are so little compared to the size of the creature, especially when you compare them with, what's our horned beast down here? Long horns. Yeah, long horns. <laughs> they don't have long horns, lamb-like horns on this, this critter. And so, we're going to look at several clues that help us to identify that this is the United States. First of all, the United States arose at the right time. John Wesley said this, He is not yet come, though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. You see, Wesley, the great Methodist reformer, understood that this power came after Catholicism would receive its wound. And we see that the United States did arise just at that time as we looked at some of these things before. It was to arise after 1798 or after the first beast had been mortally wounded or received the deadly wound. Now watch this. John beholds this beast as it is coming up or gradually arising about the time the first beast receives its wound in 1798. The word coming up is used to describe a plant that's growing that kind of comes up slowly. And it took a while for this nation to come up from 1620 until the Declaration of Independence is actually signed and ratified and we are a nation after that Revolutionary War. We find the second clue that it was to arise in a sparsely populated area and the United States did arise in exactly the right place. It rose up out of the earth, the prophecy said. Remember the first beast came out of what? Waters. Out of the sea or the waters. And the waters represent what? The waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The earth is just the opposite. There's not a whole lot of people. There's no nations. There's, it's a, a very sparsely populated area. And so it came up in the right place at the right time. The earth arises out of the earth, representing this power would arise in a sparsely populated area. The third clue we have is it is depicted as a new nation. One that had never existed before, not one that evolved from some other one, but a totally new nation. He says, I beheld another beast. Had no relationship at all to the first one. Had no relationship to the crowns on the head of the first one even. It was a nation that was to come up and be totally different and separate from the nations that were before it. The, first, the fourth point is that it was to be a democracy. You see, the United States never had a king. They wanted to make George Washington king, remember? He would have no part of it. We had to have a nation that didn't have a king. And so we, we, the, we see on this first beast, it had the horns with all of the crowns upon them. Horns are a symbol of power, and on these horns there are no crowns or no kingly authority in contrast to that first beast of Revelation 13. What we have here, as we see in the Constitution, Article 4, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a what? A Republican form of government. They're not talking about a Republican Party, Democratic Party. A Republican form of government. This is what was guaranteed. So the lamb-like horn, symbols of youth, innocent, and 
gentleness well represent the character of our government as expressed in the two fundamental principles upon which this nation was based, and that is republicanism and Protestantism. Those are represented in those two horns. Now, the fifth clue, it says that it is to be a worldwide power. It would have an influence around the world. And we do. As a matter of fact, too many times we try to flex our muscles in places that we have no business flexing muscles. Uh, trying to tell other countries what they can and cannot do. Uh, it's wrong. And uh, it gets us into a lot of trouble. And the main reason we do most of that anymore is the money. Is the money that's involved in it. The United States of America has a power that goes outside of our country. Notice this. In a broad new policy statement that is in its final drafting state, the Defense Department asserts that America's political and military mission in the post-Cold War era will be to ensure that no rival superpower is allowed to emerge in Western Europe, Asia, or the territory of the former Soviet Union. Are they succeeding? It's not going to happen, friends. We cannot go into other countries and, uh, and do what we want to do. You know, you take the look at Ukraine right now. You know, I don't agree with that president, but was that man duly elected in a democratic process? Yes, he was. Somebody said, well, he's a dictator. Well, the people put him in there. I mean, I don't like the one we got now, but I'm not going to rebel against the guy. You see, if the people put somebody in, other people, especially from other countries, need to stay out of their business, unless, of course, genocide or something like that is taking place. But we feel that we've got to be involved in the politics of every nation in the world. It says in Revelation 13, 12, he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell in you see how far reaching it is. It's going to reach beyond our own country into the whole world to have to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The sixth clue we have is to identification. It's going to change in character from that of a lamb to that of a dragon. He spake as a dragon, it said. And how does a nation speak? You see, a nation speaks through its laws, its, its legislative enactment. So it, they, they, it's talking about the legislation and cause will be to enforce what this power decrees. And this is what will eventually bring this around. And the nation speaks through its laws or legislative body today. All nations do that. Now, it said he exercised all the power of who? First the first beast. So what did that first beast do for 1,260 years? Killed anybody that wouldn't submit to their laws, remember? So we see that he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We have a death decree. We have a coming confederacy of religion and government, a church state united type thing. Notice here what Tyler, uh, Alexander Tyler said. Democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until, watch this, and see if it's not happening today. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. That's what they do. Exactly. We see this being fulfilled just in our own life right now. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate who promises the most benefits from the public treasury. This was written several years ago. As a result, a democracy always collapses over loose financial policy and is always followed by what? 
Sounds like a bad dream, doesn't it? The average age of the world's greatest powers has been 200 years. We've reached that, haven't we? And we see this government changing in a way that is just absolutely unbelievable. How is this going to happen? What's going to enable this to take place? Well, for one thing, the Constitution upon which this country is founded will be gone. As a matter of fact, we have leaders now that say it's an outdated old document. We need to get rid of it and replace it. Including the guy who took the oath to uphold that Constitution. We are told in inspiration that the time is coming when we will repudiate every principle of our Constitution. So should we be amazed when we see this happening in our, before our very eyes today? Supreme Court Justice, several years ago, a very interesting man. You read some of the stuff he wrote, a very frightening man. But this is what Justice Rehnquist had to say. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. A metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging. It should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, no separation of church and state. The church must do what the state says. In the St. Louis paper back in 91, as the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, the Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. Broadly, the court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. You see that? So the big popular churches will be helped, but the smaller, less popular churches will be hurt by what's taking place. This is from a secular paper. And it's happening, my friend. People like the mild majority, you don't hear a lot about them anymore, but these same people are still out there, at least most of them. Separation of church and state is a dangerous concept. This is because the phrase separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution, and the misuse of the phrase leads to all sorts of trouble. Now, they're right there. Separation of church and state is not found there, but what is found there is the government's got to stay out of church. Period. Not to make a law for or against one. Not to establish one or tear one down. Government has no business in church. And so it says it leads to trouble. Watch what he goes on to say. Such as trying to keep godly principles out of legislation. A thorough understanding of our Constitution is vital to our survival. Let's talk more like the Constitution and less like the bumper sticker. Wipe the phrase separation of church and state out of your vocabulary. You see, the government wants to control the church and the church wants to control the government. And both are wrong. Both are wrong. The, the principle is there. Don't try to mix them. Could it be that a return to God coerced by religious legislation will be seen as the answer to wanting moral values, economic collapse, and natural disaster? You know, I've said in meetings where these preachers present this all the time, trying to use these things here, the morals, the economy, and the disasters, to show that God is displeased and we've got to go back to Sunday worship. Watch this. For years, religious leaders in America have been persistently working to the end of establishing and enforcing religious standards by law. The Moral Majority is one group. The Lord's Day Alliance, over 18 million. The CCU, Churches of Christ United. The World Council of Churches. There's a whole list of them that, and that includes several millions of people seeking for the church to control the state. And on the other hand, you have all of the politicians wanting to control the churches. So, the Christian Coalition 
Some of you remember this guy very well. Ralph Reed. If Christians unite, we can do anything. We can pass any law or any amendment, and that's exactly what we intend to do. You see that? There's this uniting, and we'll see this in, in the next meeting. Protestantism, paganism, and Catholicism are uniting and setting up the whole framework for the institution of this prophecy being fulfilled in our very day. The right hand of God is who they think they are. Watch this one from W.A. Criswell. I believe that this notion of the separation of church and state was the figment of some infidel's imagination. Preached from pulpits all over. You know, Pat Robertson, he tried to run for president. It's a good thing he didn't make it. But I want you to see something about Pat Robertson. The next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy is the commandment for the personal benefit of each citizen. Interesting quote, isn't it? But watch where he goes. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated a day of rest have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state. As an outright insult to God and his plan, only those policies that can be shown to have clearly secular purpose are recognized. When he's talking about the Sabbath, what's he talking about? He's talking about Sunday. And this is the direction that these guys are headed. And what we see taking place today is pretty much what we saw when we studied the third chapter of Daniel. The state establishing an image, declaring that everybody had to worship the image or be put to death. Today we see this happening all over again. The Babylonian king, a powerful world leader, established a counterfeit image and compelled worship contrary to God's commandments. The issues that we face today, my friends, are several, a few of which are simply how do we worship and who do we worship? Do we worship the God of heaven or do we worship the beast and its image? The state tells us which one we are to worship. The state even tells us we cannot worship the first one. We can't even mention his name. You see, we have taken him out of schools and everywhere else. The other issue, the authority of God's word, loyalty to Christ and obedience to his commandments. Or do we disavow the word of God do we feel that we don't have to keep his commandments, but that we can do what the state tells us to say because Caesar is above God? Remember, that's why the early Christians died. Had they simply said, yes, Caesar is God, they could have lived. If they'd have thrown just a little bit of incense on an altar to Caesar, they would have turned them loose. But... Caesar is not above God. Jesus himself said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God's. Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Who are they? Here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is what the whole issue is going to revolve around. Those who have God's seal, those who have the beast's mark. America, my friends, has forgotten the law of God. Not only forgotten it, it has outlawed the law of God. That law has been expelled from our schools, from our courtrooms, and from the hearts of the American people. As a result, we see the things that are going on in the world today. Do you know, I personally, of course, I'm a very, very young man. <laughs> Just wanted you to know that one. But I do not remember when 
I was in school and God was still in our schools. People coming to school with guns and killing other children. I don't remember that. Can any of you remember things like that from your younger day? And some of you are young. Can you remember from when? Just a few years back. But the further we move ourselves away from God, the worse things become. Because as we move away from God as a nation, the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the world. And as soon, to put it literally, all hell is going to break loose. The angels holding the four winds will release those winds. And there will be a time of trouble such as has never been seen before. But right now, the Spirit of God is still working on the hearts of people. And Jesus is still reaching out to people to come to Him, to put Him first, and to make a decision that regardless of what man says, they will not worship an image. They will not receive a mark other than the seal of God. And they will be found ready and waiting when Jesus comes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for your blessings to us. We thank you for your word you've given to us to be a light and a lamp to our feet. And I pray, dear Father, now that as we conclude this study and prepare for the next one, that your spirit would continue to watch over us, give us wisdom and guidance, Father. Help us, dear Lord, to have our minds and our hearts open to the teachings of your word and the promptings of your spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.